Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. You ready to worship the Lord today? Amen. If uh, your week was like mine, I'm sure you are exhausted and you're looking forward to, I mean, just taking a rest in the house of the Lord. Amen. We thank the Lord for a day such as this when we can come together as his children to worship him and just relax before him. Amen. So if you're here today, I want you to just leave yourself at the feet of Jesus. Okay? Just forget about everything that is going on outside this building. And just soak in everything that he has for you this morning. Praise the Lord. Amen. If you're visiting with us for the first time, we want to say a special welcome to you. Okay? We would like to get to know you better. Talk to any one of us. If you see anybody in a vest, just approach them, red or green. Approach them. We'd like to get to know you better. And we have these cards in the pockets behind the chairs. Fill out one. Okay, give us a little more information about you. Somebody will contact you and uh, have, answer any questions that you might have. Also, if you're here, anybody, if you have any prayer requests that you want the prayer partners to come alongside you, please fill out one of these. If you fill out in one of these, please drop them in any of the uh, offering boxes that we have throughout the building. Amen. Again, this red shirt, I wear it every Sunday to remind you that the prayer partners will be wearing this. If anybody has a prayer request, if you need prayer for anything, we would like to come alongside you. Okay? Approach us. We'll be standing in front at the end of the service. Come forward. There's no shame in asking for prayer. Okay? Come forward, and we would come alongside you. Amen. We have our tithes and offering envelopes also in the back pocket of the seats. Uh, if you brought anything to the Lord, just put it in and drop it in the offering boxes scattered throughout the, the, the building. I want to encourage you this morning with a verse from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. It says, But as it is written... I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor ha have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Amen. Your labor of love in the Lord is not in vain. God sees and he knows. Continue laboring in the Lord. Continue loving the Lord. Continue sharing the love of God. He has prepared for you. Something that no ear has heard, that it has not even entered into the minds and hearts of men. Look at all the inventions that they have, we have in the world. But what God has for you supersedes all of it. Amen. Keep on trusting, keep on loving, and keep on working in the field for God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we bless you for this morning. We thank you that you love us so much that not only did you send your son to come and die for us, but you are preparing a place for us. We give you glory and we give you praise. We come before you this morning with expectant hearts. Father, feel us, feel us, feel us. We thank you, Lord, and we bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we stand and worship?
us, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy in all my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I will. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morning. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. One love could remember no wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all-knowing, He counts not their song. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every more. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly long. What Father so tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. And our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they're many. His mercy is more. What riches of kindness He lavished on us. His blood was the payment, His life was the cause. We stood neath the dead we could never afford. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Hmm. Lord, I thank you for that. God, um, I, just, I just thank you so much for this morning, Lord. And I just pray that as we take this time in our morning just to spend time with you, I just pray that we're ready Lord, that we've taken this time to worship you in song, that we just open up our hearts to you, Lord. Um, just thank you for this morning, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you take a minute and say good morning to someone around you? Echoey. Am I not doing it? Echoey. I know. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it.
was like, yeah. So maybe if I put my hand on it. Me neither. <laughs> All right. Good to see everybody. Glad you're here. Go ahead and have a seat. Uh, let's look at our announcement sheet for just a few moments. Announcements are uh, an important part of what we do at Calvary Chapel. And by the way, welcome. Uh, but we like taking time to do announcements because it's not, it's not about information. It's about vision. This way you have an opportunity to know what's going on in the life of your church and to pray about where and how the Lord would have you get involved in serving here. Uh, so let's look at our announcement sheet real quick. Don't forget, if you have taken one of the Christmas shoe boxes that's been made available by Operation Christmas Child, they are due back on Sunday, December, or no, Sunday, November 21st. So that is next Sunday. Uh, make sure that you're aware of that. That way we can get to them delivered in time. Also next Sunday after church, there is going to be a Christmas carding slash uh, crafting day. So Jenny Thornton and Cynthia Phillips are going to be meeting with a group in the Milk and Honey Cafe after church. So if you want to get together and just have an afternoon of fun and just kind of color, not color, but like craft and decorate some homemade cards that you can make available to people, um, I just think it's going to be a lot of fun. So if that's something you're interested in, take note of that. I don't think the group's going to stick around real long. Um, but I do think it's going to be a special time. You know, cards are one of those things that in the, in the digital age in which we live, you know, it, it's rare to even get cards that often anymore. But uh, when you get one, it's really a, a way to make you feel special. And so this will be a great opportunity um, if you're a teen and you want to get involved in doing this, but if you're older as well and you want to get involved. And guys, yes, it's open to you too. I happen to be very artistic myself, so don't feel weird about going to a carding day next Sunday after church. Okay, the other thing listed in here that's going to be happening after church is not going to be happening next Sunday after church. Um, so we were going to be having a worship team informational meeting, but the reason we can't do it next Sunday is just we've got some people out of town. So Kayla, who is our worship leader, but by the way, with all that reverb on your, on your microphone today, I feel like you should do a werewolf sound for us right now. Can you do a werewolf sound? Can I do it real quick? Oh! That's what it was like when I got up this morning to drive to church. It was like, oh, looks like London out there. So anyway, pray for everybody who's driving around. Okay, come back to the announcements for a moment. Um, the worship team meeting, Kayla is going to be getting in touch with you if you have expressed an interest to join our worship team. So just be ready for that. We want to pull everybody together as we come into the holiday season and, of course, looking into 2022 for how some more folks can get involved in our worship team. So if you've not expressed an interest to Kayla and it is something that you would like to do, let me encourage you to find Kayla and let her know, let me know, let one of us know, we would love to kind of plug you in and just give you the information that you need for getting involved in our worship ministry. Um, Sunday, December, no, sorry, Saturday, December 18th, and I mention this now because we're starting signups for it today. We are going to be doing our annual free Christmas gift wrapping. Uh, we're going to be doing it in front of Sam's Club this year on Walton Avenue here in Yuba City. This is a great way to just be in the community. I love the conversations that we have with people when they kind of walk by and it says, you know, the sign says free Christmas gift wrapping and they say, how much is it? And you say, it's free. And they're like, well, how much do you have to donate? I'm like, it's free. And they're like, what's the catch? And you're like, it's free. And they're like, well, why are you doing it? And we're like, we do this as an expression of the free gift of salvation that has come to us in Jesus Christ. And while they're having their gifts wrapped, we engage them with a little Christmas trivia quiz. And, you know, the questions are kind of designed to very strategically bring the Word of God in. So you ask questions like, 
what was the first movie where the Christmas classic song White Christmas premiered? And of course, people always say White Christmas. And the answer is Holiday Inn, which was the Bing Crosby Fred Astaire classic. And then you ask things like, how many wise men visited Jesus at his birth? And people say three, and you're like, actually, the Bible doesn't say. And technically, it wasn't at his birth. It was a couple years after his birth. And then you, you keep going, and then the last question, of course, is why was Jesus born? And I love it, you know, some people will say to, to pay for our sins. And you're like, yes, that's exactly right. And you get to share the gospel with them. But it's also interesting, too, when you say to somebody, why was Jesus born? I've literally had people say to me, I don't know. It, it, it kind of staggers the mind to think that here we are in 2021, that there would be people who have never heard about why Jesus was born, and yet there are people out there who've never heard. Okay, so that's a long way of really trying to say to you, let me encourage you to get involved in our free Christmas gift wrapping. Sign up for a two-hour shift. Come with us, serve alongside your brothers and sisters in Christ. We give out coffee and hot chocolate. It's a lot of fun. That's happening on Saturday, December 18th. Okay, other things, we have our tithes and offerings. You can see up in the upper right-hand corner of your announcement sheet all the different Christmas stuff we have coming on. Uh, coming up, I should say. And then we also have these handy-dandy handouts. They're not inserted in your announcement sheet, but there are some at our ministry center table as you make your way down the hall, which is where you'll also find the sign-up sheet for our free Christmas gift wrapping. Um, pray for Pastor Keith. He's down at Calvary Chapel Tracy this morning sharing about our, our Bible college, so we're going to keep him in prayer, especially with how foggy it is because oh, it could be dangerous coming through those mountain passes on the way home. Um, let's silence our cell phones, but before we do, let me invite you, and yes, I say invite you because I see it as an opportunity to go to our Facebook page and simply hair, hair, <laughs> hit the share button. You guys ever done that, like where you combine a couple of words in your brain? Hair. Something's on my mind. <clears throat> Amanda was like, why are you bicking your head this weekend? And I was like, because if I don't, I look like a friar, right? <laughs> Sorry, I'm just having a moment up here. <clears throat> I think during the last song, I should go take my medication. Um, <laughs> okay, go to our Facebook page and hair... I'm kidding. Hit the share button. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Hit the share button, okay? Um, we want, why? Why? Because we want more people to like Calvary Chapel, Yuba City? No, because we want more people to hear the Word of God. Amen? Right? Because God's Word has the ability to save people. God's Word has the ability to give people the wisdom and direction they need, and it could be for their marriages. It could be for a spiritual scar that they have in the past. It could be the gospel coming to someone for the very first time. We live in an amazing time when because of the internet and because of social media platforms like Facebook and others, we can get the word of God out there to more people than most cultures have been able to in the past. And this is just a simple thing that we can all do when we go to our Facebook page to help get the word out there. Okay, let's, uh, let's stand. We're going to pray together one more time, and then we're going to continue to worship the Lord. <clears throat> if you need to borrow a Bible... Raise your hand, Spud, and some of the other ushers and bring one around to you so you can follow along with us this morning. God, we love you. We thank you for an opportunity to come to church. Um, as Pastor Mallet reminded us earlier, to just sit and rest and, and be at your feet and bask in your presence. God, we thank you for the joy you've put in our hearts. We thank you that we can laugh at church. We thank you that we get to fellowship with one another and reconnect with people we might not have seen in a week or two. And of course, Lord, we thank you that you have made us to worship you, and you invite us into your presence. Lord, would you just take glory to yourself today? Would you just move front and center of this whole assembly of saints and magnify yourself and just minister to every heart in a way that only you can? God, we love you, we exalt you, we bless you, and we just ask that you meet us here. In Jesus' name, amen. How deep 
the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The Father turns His face away as wounds which mar the chosen one. sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. Sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything. No power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give in I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer But this I know with all my heart To be my ransom, his wounds to be my ransom. Lord, I just thank you so much just for us all being here together, Lord, and just singing to you. It's just so sweet, Lord. And I just pray that as we um get ready to study your word and just just ready to listen to what you have to say to us, God. I just pray that we are all ready to receive your word, Lord, and to use it in our lives and to really change, God. I just pray that um, as we hear your word, that we do something about it and not just hear it, but that we do something with it. <laughs> in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Is this on? Can y'all hear me? Yeah? Check, check. This means yes. Exactly. Arr! Hey, will you guys bring those lights up back there? <clears throat> All right, let's turn in our Bibles this morning to Luke's Gospel, chapter 10. <clears throat> and one more push that if you haven't gone to our Facebook page and shared our live stream, make sure you do that. All right, Luke, chapter 10. We are resuming our series this morning of the parables of Jesus. We took a break for a couple of weeks when we did our Harvest Fair outreach, and then, of course, last weekend for our women's conference. Um, but up to this point, we have looked at quite a few things when it comes to the parables of Jesus. We've looked at the purpose of parables. We've looked at the parable of the soils, which is arguably Jesus' most famous parable from Mark chapter 4. But we've also looked at the parable of the wheat and the tares, and we've also looked at the parable of the wedding feast. So if you weren't here for those studies, um, I always want to encourage people to go back and study through those things on your own. So you'll find those studies either on our Facebook page or our YouTube channel, 
or by going directly to our website, ccubacity.com. But this morning, uh, we're picking things up with another famous parable of Jesus. All the way back at the beginning of this series, um, I mentioned that we were going to kind of do three sections of parables. So all through the month of October, what we basically focused on was parables that dealt with our relationship with God. Now as we've come into November, we're going to be looking at parables that deal with our relationship with others. And of course, what better parable to kick off that particular emphasis than the parable of the Good Samaritan? Um, Almost everybody has probably some degree of familiarity when it comes to the Good Samaritan. There are allusions to it and references to it and depictions of it all throughout society. Rembrandt did a painting of the Good Samaritan. Van Gogh did a painting of the Good Samaritan. In fact, all through uh, medieval art, this was the most famous parable to depict. Uh, Science fiction author Isaac Asimov references the Good Samaritan. There are Good Samaritan laws which encourage people to serve others and reach out and help those who are less fortunate. One article says, This name has been used for a number of charitable organizations, including Samaritan, Samaritan's Purse, Sisters of the Good Samaritan, the Samaritan Befrienders of Hong Kong. The name Good Samaritan Hospital is used for a number of hospitals around the world, even in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. On the TV series Daredevil, we have all kinds of references to the Good Samaritan. Wilson Fisk, a.k.a. Kingpin, once said this, I am not the Samaritan. I'm not the priest or the Levite. I am the ill intent who set upon the traveler on a road that he should not have been on. So I'm sure that most of us, even if we didn't grow up going to church, probably have some frame of reference when it comes to the idea of the Good Samaritan. But before we dig in, what I'd like to do is pray one more time, and let's just ask the Lord to to speak to us this morning. Father, we love you, and uh, we pause because you tell us if we acknowledge you in all of our ways, you will direct our path. And so what we want to do, Lord, now is acknowledge you with this time of Bible study, and we ask that you would direct my words, that you would direct our thoughts, that you would take your word off the written page, that you would impart it into our hearts, and you would make us more like you, Jesus. We know that's your will for our lives, for us to be continually transformed more and more into your image and likeness. And so this morning, Lord, through this parable, we see such a powerful picture of your great love for us. And so I pray you'll use it this morning to shape and mold our hearts. We love you so much. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, for context, before we actually come to the story of the Good Samaritan, uh, let's take a look at the exchange that precedes it because it sets up the overall context of the point of the passage. Luke chapter 10, we'll start reading there in verse 25. We read, Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested Jesus, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? That's a good question, by the way. Uh, Jesus, in a very classic Jesus moment, replies in verse 26 by saying, What's written in the law? What's your reading of it? Uh, One Bible commentator by the name of Marvin Pate said, Jesus' answer seems mildly sarcastic. Jesus asks, what does the law say? In other words, you're the lawyer who interprets the law. You tell me what it says. And so this unnamed lawyer in verse 27 responds first by quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6, the Jewish Shema, and then Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. He says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And he said, your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus answers in verse 28, you have answered rightly. Do this and live. Now, I don't believe that Jesus is just kind of shining this lawyer on when he says to him, you have answered rightly. I think Jesus is being totally sincere here. There was another occasion in uh, Mark chapter 12, for instance, where we read that one of the scribes came to Jesus, and having heard him reasoning together, perceiving that Jesus answered well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? By the way, the reference to the first commandment, that's not talking about a commandment that was given in a sequential order. 
Because technically speaking, if that was the question, Jesus should have answered by saying, be fruitful and multiply. Because that's the first commandment that's given in Scripture, Genesis chapter 1, verse 22. What he's asking here when he says, what is the first commandment? It might be, more take, it might be taken more literally, what is the greatest commandment? In fact, that's how it's rendered in Matthew chapter 22. What's the greatest commandment? Or what is the most important commandment? What this guy is asking is, what is it all about? What is the most important thing? And Jesus answers in Mark chapter 12, verse 29, by saying, the first of all commandments is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And he said, the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. He says, there is no commandment greater than these. In Matthew 22, verse 40, he says, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So when Jesus asks this lawyer, what does the law say? What is your understanding of it? When the lawyer quotes the very same passages that Jesus himself quotes in other portions of Scripture, I believe Jesus is being totally sincere when he says that is exactly right. That is the correct answer. Do that and you will live. But watch what happens. Luke 10, verse 29, watch what the lawyer says. Wanting to justify himself, he asks, and who is my neighbor? Uh huh. So now the plot thickens, right? Or as my dad used to say, the thought plickens, right? <laughs> here here the, the lawyer does something that we love to do sometimes. First of all, take note of a couple of things. The answer to the lawyer's question was, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. When the lawyer asks, who is my neighbor? It's obvious that he thought he was doing the first part of the commandment, right? He doesn't respond by saying, how do I love God better? He jumps to the second part of the commandment and he says, and who's my neighbor? David Guzik writes this, The lawyer measured himself against both commands. His first and perhaps greatest mistake was in assuming he had fulfilled the first commandment. He says the lawyer's second mistake is in thinking that he could fulfill the commandment to love God and still not possibly fulfill the command to love his neighbor. By the way, we have a tendency to do the same thing ourselves. Even though Scripture straight up tells us in 1 John chapter 4 that if somebody says, I love God and hates his brother, that person is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? This commandment we have from him, meaning Jesus, that he who loves God must also love his brother. You see, it's faulty thinking sometimes. And we see this even amongst believers where we'll claim very passionately to love Jesus. Meanwhile, we'll harbor a grudge against a brother or sister in Christ. We'll withhold forgiveness from someone, right? Even though Scripture says these things ought not be so. In fact, Scripture says if you're doing that, take note of this, you're probably not a Christian, we say, what do you mean? 1 John chapter 1, verse 14. This is how we know that we have passed from death to life. So if you want to know that you're born again, here's how you know when we love the brethren. But he who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Chapter 2 says, he who says he's in the light and hates his brother, is actually in darkness, and walks in darkness, and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. It is impossible for someone to genuinely love God and not love other people. In fact, when Scripture says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, this is the first commandment, and the second is like it, it's more closely translated, the second is linked to it. Loving our neighbor 
is directly linked to loving God. So this lawyer, he does something that we often do, right? When the answer is given, love your neighbor as yourself, the lawyer asks in verse 29, well, who's my neighbor, right? And he does so because he's looking for a loophole, right? This is exactly what we do. The word of God says, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, who's my neighbor? Right? Is my neighbor only the person who lives next door to me? Is my neighbor the person who lives across the street from me? Does the person who lives behind me, are, are they my neighbor? What about that annoying guy who lives down the street to the left and three houses up on the right? Is that person my neighbor? Check this out. Scripture says we're to love our neighbor. We're to love one another. We're to love our spouses. We're even supposed to love our enemies. Who's left out? The Christian's job, our mission, our mandate is to love people. That's what scripture teaches us as believers, to love people. But like the lawyer, we can be so creative at looking for ways around being obedient to what the Word of God says. We can be so clever when it comes to looking for ways out of doing what Scripture says. And at the end of the day, it's probably for the same reason as this lawyer. Verse 29 says, but he wanting to justify himself. You know what it means to justify yourself, right? To, to justify oneself is to attempt to appear just or right, right? It's the attempt to appear as though you are doing the right thing. So, so here's the rationale. Scripture says, love your neighbor. Well, if I don't really know who my neighbor is, right, then I can't be held accountable. If I don't completely understand who my neighbor is, I'm trying to do my best, but I mean, after all, who, who's, who's really my neighbor, that's the thought process. And we'll do the same thing. Scripture will say, do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And we'll say, well, what does it really mean to assemble together? Go to church. That's what it means, right? <laughs> Scripture will say to us, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. And then we'll watch all kinds of garbage and we'll say, well, I'm free in Christ. Scripture says, do all things without complaining. And we'll say, well, that's really hard to do. I mean, Kevin, have you seen the prices of gas lately? Have you seen how much groceries have gone up? And besides, if we just had somebody else in office, stop! Do all things without complaining. Scripture says, as each one has received a gift, use it to minister to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And we'll say this, oh, well, I served in church for years. What exactly does that mean? As though serving the Lord has an expiration date, right? As though serving the Lord is like military service where we serve for 10 years, but now I got an honorable discharge and I no longer have the responsibility to use my gifts in serving Jesus in a local church, right? We need to stop trying to justify ourselves and look for creative ways out of being obedient and just do what Scripture says, this is why Scripture tells us to become like a little child. We just do what the Word of God says. Now, Jesus is about to rock his listener's world with this story that he's going to tell, right? Now we come to the actual story of the Good Samaritan. Let's read together, starting in verse 30. Jesus answered the man's question, right? He's like, well, who's my neighbor? So here's Jesus' answer. He says, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him, for, leaving him half dead. Verse 31. Now, by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. Verse 33. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Verse 35, on the next day, when he departed, the Samaritan took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. 
And then Jesus concludes the parable by asking in verse 36, So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And the lawyer answered in verse 37 and said, He who showed mercy on him. And Jesus said, You go and do likewise. Okay, there's a lot in this one little story that Jesus tells. For starters, Jesus paints a picture that any Jew in his day would have been familiar with. He says in verse 30 how a man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. I think we have some pictures of the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. No, we don't have them. I can't see you. They got eaten by the vortex. Okay, so go on to Google. I don't often recommend going to Google. But you can look up the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. Uh, Bible commentator David Guzik writes, The road from Jerusalem to Jericho was infamous for crime and robbery. It was known as the Bloody Way. Marvin Pate said, This road was famous for its lurking dangers, especially robbers. Dr. Martin Luther King on the day before his assassination, described the road this way. He said, When Mrs. King and I were first in Jerusalem, we rented a car and drove from Jerusalem to Jericho. As soon as we got on that road, I said to my wife, I can see why Jesus used this as the setting for his parable. It is a winding, meandering road, really conducive for ambushing. You start in Jerusalem, which is about 1,200 feet above sea level, And about 15 minutes later, by the time you get to Jericho, you're about 2,200 feet below sea level. He said that is a dangerous road. And listen, because people were so familiar with this setting, we've talked before about these parables and how they were such an effective mode of teaching. Because what stories have a tendency to do is they have a tendency to bypass the intellect and connect immediately with the heart, right? Jesus' listeners would have been able to insert themselves into this particular tale, right? And bear in mind, too, what Jesus is doing with this parable. The context is loving one's neighbor. Jesus is about to illustrate powerfully what that looks like this morning. We have a tendency to think of love as a powerful set of emotions, But scripturally speaking, love is all about action. We remind ourselves of how the Bible defines love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you don't have to turn there, but I encourage you to look it up later. 1 Corinthians 13, starting in verse 4 all the way through verse 8, Scripture says this, Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Love is not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely. 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 Yes, I emphasize that. Because over the past year and a half, Christians have been very rude. Reminds me of the story of when the new pastor got the job at the church. And he gets up and he teaches this powerful sermon. And everybody's like, that was amazing. So next Sunday, he gets up, he teaches the same sermon. Okay, and the board members think, well, okay, you know, it's a good, good sermon. It bears repeating. Next Sunday, he gets up and he teaches the same sermon. A month goes by, and he's teaching the same sermon week after week. And finally, you know, the, 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 elder, the, board, of the, the, el, the board of elders approach him. And they say, Pastor, why are you teaching the same Bible study? He said, when people start doing what this one says, I'll move on. Love is not rude. Pastor Keith and I were talking just yesterday. Devin was there too, uh, or Friday, I should say. Um, how You ever been to like a timeshare presentation? <laughs> you know what I hate about timeshare presentations? They force you to be rude, right? They absolutely force you to be rude. I go into these timeshare presentations. Well, I don't, it's not like I do it often. I think I've done it once or twice, and I kind of said I'm never doing it again. Because, you know, they kind of dangle the carrot in front of you. Oh, you'll get a stay at the Great Wolf Lodge or whatever, Disneyland tickets. And you go in, and of course, they walk you through a two-hour-long presentation. They show you a mock-up of property, and then they're like, you want to buy one, don't you? Let's do a math. How much do you spend on vacation per year? And they break it all down for you, and they get to the end, and they're like, are you interested? And I'm like, no. (laughs) 
And they're like, well, how about if we do this? And they redo the math and like, maybe I can do this for you. Are you interested now, Mr. Fitcher? I'm like, no. And they're like, you know what? Let me go talk to my boss. And then they come back, and then there's somebody else who's like, you know, the so-and-so was not permitted to make you this offer, but I'm going to make you this offer. And they show them, Mr. Fritcher, how does this strike you? And I'm like, no, I'm not interested. And they're like, Mr. Fitcher, and, and there, there have been times when I've just had to say, look, I don't know how else you need me to say no. You go find the highest person in a position of authority, have them come in here right now and make me the absolute best offer they can make me so I can tell them no, so that you can give me my Disneyland tickets, because that's why I'm here, <laughs> right? And it's like they force you to be rude, so I absolutely hate doing them. But anyway, and I struggle with it because love does not behave rudely. Coming back to Scripture, love does not seek its own. Love is not provoked. Love does not think evil. Love doesn't rejoice in iniquity. It rejoices in the truth. Listen to this. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. Love never fails. Now, I don't know if you noticed this, but as we read through those, not a single mention of emotion. Not a single mention of what love feels like. What you have is a list of attitudes and actions because love is about what we do. It's not about how we feel. David Guzik writes, the love that the Bible tells us to have for people is not a warm, fuzzy feeling that we have in our hearts. The love that we are to have for people is a love that does something for them apart from how we might feel about them. John Stott famously said this, Christian love is not the product of our emotions. It's the servant of the will. I'll say that again because it's good. Christian love is not the product of our emotions. It is the servant of the will. 1 John 3.18 says, Little children, let us not love in word or in tongue. In other words, what we say, Right? But in deed and in truth, the things that we do, love takes action. And Jesus is about to powerfully illustrate that this morning. He says in verse 31, First, by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw the man who had been stripped and wounded and left for dead, he passed by on the other side. So we know that the priest saw the guy, because Jesus tells us. He saw the wounded man. He just did nothing. Okay, verse 32, a Levite when he arrived at that place, came and looked, right? And he passed by on the other side. These two figures, again, would have resonated profoundly with Jesus' listeners. A priest and a Levite. It sounds like a bad joke, right? A priest and a Levite find a wounded guy lying by the side of the road. They do nothing. They're both figures of religious officiation. Adam Clark said, priest and Levite are mentioned here Partly to show that these were persons who, listen to this, from the nature of their office were most obliged to perform works of mercy and from whom a person in distress had a right to expect immediate help and comfort. Their inhuman conduct here is a flat breach of the law. David Guzik writes, we can think of the excuses these two men could have used. We might hear them saying, well, the road is too dangerous for me to stop and help the man. He might be a decoy for an ambush. I've got to get to the temple and start my, uh, perform my service for the Lord. I've got to get home and see my family. Somebody should really help that man. If I'm going to the, serve the temple of the Lord, I can't get my clothes bloody, which was true. I don't know CPR. It's a hopeless case. I'm only one person. The job is too big. I can pray for him. He brought it on himself. He should have never been alone on such a dangerous road. He didn't ask for help. And we hear that list and we might think some of them are mildly funny. Or we might think, man, that's absolutely horrible. And then we'll come to Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount and we'll read, Give to everyone who asks of you. Or we'll read, From him who takes away your goods, don't ask for them back. From him who wants to borrow from you, don't turn away. Love your enemies, do good, and lend, 
hoping for nothing in return. Speak well of those who curse you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. And we can think of the litany of excuses we might offer for not doing those things. Charles Spurgeon said, I never knew of a man who refused to help the poor who did not first give at least one admirable excuse. You see, going back to that quote from Adam Clark, let's put this spin on it, right? Because simply based on what Jesus teaches in the Bible, check this out. Christians, like the priest and the Levite in this parable, Christians are the people on planet Earth most obliged to perform acts of mercy. We're the ones, based on the teachings of Jesus, we're the ones who should be the first to perform acts of mercy and the ones whom the world, based on the teachings of Jesus, has the right to expect that we offer help. Adam Clark said, our inhuman conduct towards people in need would be a flat breach of the Word of God. 1 John chapter 3 says this, By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And look, that's great. That sounds very agreeable as long as we leave it in the intangible place of being a virtue or an ethic, right? Oh, we should love the way Jesus loves because he laid down his life for us. But then the very next verse says, but whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in that person? And then that becomes the context for the verse that says, little children, we should not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. You see, the Bible defines a love like Jesus as saying, if you have this world's goods and you see somebody in need, you should respond to it. In fact, if we don't, the Bible says, how is the love of God actually in you? That's what 1 John says. Now, to really get under their skin, watch what Jesus does, right? In verse 33, he says, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. Okay, this is a dynamic of this parable that unfortunately is somewhat lost on us nowadays. Because we, the only frame of reference we have for a Samaritan is the parable of the Good Samaritan, right? So, a little bit of history this morning, right? In the days of King Rehoboam, who was Solomon's son, the kingdom of Israel becomes divided. And it becomes divided into two nations. Israel is the ten nations to the north. And then Judah is the two remaining tribes to the south. Samaria is the capital city of the northern kingdom. And Jerusalem is the capital city of the southern kingdom. Jeroboam, who's the king of the northern empire... He changed the historical worship requirements for the people who lived there. Check this out. He said, you no longer have to travel to Jerusalem to offer sacrifices to God. You can do that right here in the northern kingdom. And he sets up idols in Dan and Bethel. By the way, for all the Bible trivia nuts, this is what the context is when Jesus meets the Samaritan woman in John's Gospel, chapter 4, and she asks the question, our fathers worshipped on this mountain. It was Mount Gerizim in the northern territory. She said, Samaritan forefathers worshipped here. But you Jews say we should worship in Jerusalem. This is what she's referring to. Okay, so the kingdom becomes divided. Jeroboam changes the law and says, you don't have to go to Jerusalem. Then, several years later, the northern territory falls to the Assyrian Empire. And the Assyrian Empire had this tactic when they conquered a particular territory. They would look at society and they would take anybody who was prominent or wealthy or considered influential or maybe intelligent. They would deport them all. And they would just kind of leave the ragtags of society. And then 2 Kings chapter 17 tells us that they import 
Five different people groups. The king of Syria brought people from Babylon, Kutha, Ava, Hamath, and from Sepharvaim and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And so the remaining Jews in the northern territory who were the outcasts of society, they now begin to intermarry with the people that the Assyrians brought in. And from that point on, the Samaritans just be kind of come viewed as a cultural and religious half-breed by the Jews. They didn't look at them as being fully Jewish. And they, the Samaritans adopted the idolatrous worship practices. The Samaritans became a perennial problem for the Jews when they were trying to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem after the exiles returned. Uh, the Samaritans only held to the Pentateuch, the first, books, first five books of the Old Testament. They completely discounted the books of prophecy and the books of poetry. They worship on Mount Gerizim. In Jesus' day, Jews would not even walk through Samaria. They would go around it. It would be like you having such just a horrible attitude about, I don't know, Yuba City, that if you had to drive from the north to the south, you would just completely circumnavigate it, right? You wouldn't even go through it. Rabbis taught that if a Jew saw a Gentile woman giving birth, they were not allowed to help because you would only be bringing another Gentile into the world. Jews believed that Gentiles were born for one purpose, and it was to be kindling to stoke the flames of hell. Check this out. They thought worse of Samaritans. My point is, Jews absolutely hated Samaritans. They absolutely despised them, which is why, by the way, at the end of this parable, when Jesus asks the question in verse 36, Which of these three men do you think was neighbor to him who fell among thieves? The lawyer responds by saying, he who showed mercy on him. He can't even bring himself to say Samaritan. He's just like the the third guy. The, The third guy did it, right? Because he couldn't utter the word Samaritan. My point is this. When Jesus tells a story and he says, a priest and a Levite don't help the injured man, but a Samaritan did? Okay, there would have been a visible reaction amongst the listening crowd. I mean, people would have spit their drink out, right? People would have averted their eyes. They would have been shuffling their feet. They would have been swallowing hard. You could have heard a pin drop at this moment because Jesus doesn't just say the Samaritan had compassion and leave it at that. For their sake and ours, he defines what the Samaritan's compassion looks like, right? He points to a measurable set of actions and says, this is what it looks like for somebody to have compassion on somebody else. Check out verse 34. The Samaritan went to the injured man and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, took care of him, On the next day, verse 35, when the Samaritan departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. David Guzik observes, the wine, which contained alcohol, would have had an antiseptic effect on the man's wounds. The oil helped to ease the pain. To set the injured man on his own animal meant that the Samaritan was now walking, And it seems that two denarii would have provided for the man's needs at the inn for for about two or three weeks. And then he says, if he spends more, here's my credit card number. And when I come back, I'll settle up with you. Wow. Now, as I say, the cultural impact is somewhat lost on us. Because we don't really have a frame of reference of exactly who a Samaritan is. So here's what I need everybody to do as kind of a personal exercise. You, in your mind, impose upon the identity of the Samaritan any particular people group that you have a particular beef with. Okay? So let's say, for instance, Jesus is telling the parable in the modern day context and he says... This guy's walking down the road, he gets mugged, he gets beat up, and he gets left for dead. And the Catholic priest comes along and he doesn't do anything. 
And then a Calvary Chapel pastor comes by, and he doesn't do anything. And then a homosexual comes by, and he has compassion on him. And he gives him medicine, and he bandages his wounds, and he puts him in his vehicle, and he drives him to a nearby hotel, and he pays his bill enough to stay there two or three weeks. And now here's the point of the parable. You be like the homosexual. Or how about a Democrat comes by? How about a Biden supporter comes by? Or a Trump supporter? Or an illegal immigrant? Somebody who lives here in the good old United States of America and hasn't gone through the naturalization process to become a legalized citizen. Kevin, are you actually suggesting that there are people that I like really have a beef with? Yeah. Yeah, because we all do. And if we study through this parable and we miss that point, we have completely set aside one of the main applications of the parable. Do you understand that what's going on here? Here's a guy who think he understood the word of God correctly. And Jesus tells a parable and essentially says, and that people group that you can't stand actually understand what, understands what righteousness looks like more than you do. Now you be like the homosexual. You be like the Biden supporter. You be like the Trump supporter. You be like the illegal immigrant. You be like the member of the Black Lives Matter movement. And see, right now, here's what's happening around the room. People are like, okay, Kevin, I was with you up until this point, right? I was tracking with you. But now people are looking away, and they don't want to make eye contact with me, and they're clear in their throat, and they're thinking, maybe it's time to go. Because now we're starting to get a little too close to home. But the reality is, if there are people in our hearts that we cannot stand, do you understand? The problem isn't them. It's us. The problem is in our hearts. And we have to deal with that if we're going to be right with God. This is an absolutely staggering illustration that Jesus gives. This person that you absolutely hate, he says, did more than the two members of the religious community. Now, look, it would have been one thing if Jesus told this parable and he said, a priest came by and did nothing, a Levite came by and did nothing, and a Jew came by and did nothing. That's one thing. But when he says a Samaritan came by, and now which one do you think loves his neighbor? G. Campbell Morgan said this, by the end of this parable, we're arrested by the fact that Jesus has completely shifted the ground of the original question and by his reply says, in effect, that the question as to who is a neighbor is not nearly as important as to the question, to whom am I being a neighbor? Jesus says in verse 37, you go and do likewise. Now, here's the thing. I don't think that this necessarily means we're supposed to live our lives. I just dislodged a piece of food from one of my teeth. I'm sorry. I know, I know, guys, I'm completely breaking the mood, but you're going to want to know why I just did that. You know, you're like, what's he doing? Is it a weird sermon illustration? Okay, I don't think that this means we're supposed to res repl respond to every need that we come across. David Guzik says, after all, the Samaritan didn't establish a hospital for unfortunate travelers, but it does mean we're to show a concern for the needs that are right in front of us. Alexander McLaren said, listen to this, the world would be a changed place if every Christian would simply attend to the sorrows that are right in front of them. Let me say that again. The world would be a changed place if every Christian would simply attend to the sorrows that are right in front of him. Jesus, after teaching this parable about what love looks like, about what compassion does, turns around and he says, now you go and you do that. You go and you do that. And we're confronted by the fact that if we're honest with ourselves, we probably aren't living this way being attentive to the needs of the world around us. But the question is this, was Jesus, 
Was Jesus this way? Many commentators draw out similarities between the Samaritan and Jesus. They say the Samaritan was an outsider, despised by many, just like Jesus. The Samaritan came after everyone else failed to meet the need. The Samaritan arrived before it was too late. The Samaritan arrived with everything that was necessary. The Samaritan came right to the afflicted man. The Samaritan provided tender care. The Samaritan made sure that the man's future needs were provided for. John Newton, who famously wrote the hymn Amazing Grace, wrote another hymn called How Kind the Good Samaritan, which begins this way. How kind the good Samaritan to him who fell among the thieves. Thus Jesus pities fallen men and heals the wounds the soul receives. See, we might not live this way, but Jesus does. And so the key then becomes simply letting Jesus live through us. I think this, it sounds so simple, right? But I honestly think one of the biggest hurdles for Christians is when we try to be good Christians. If you're trying to do something, that does not mean you are dead because dead people can't do anything. The goal of being a Christian is to die and just let Jesus live through you, to be filled with the Spirit of God to be led by his will, to be conformed more and more into his image and likeness, to have the fruits of the Spirit supernaturally produced in us and then begin to show forth from our lives as he works in us. It's not necessarily to try to be a loving person or to try to be patient or to try to be kind or to try to be good. It's to realize I can't be those things. And so rather than trying, Lord, I just pray that you get me out of the way and I pray you fill me with the Spirit and I pray you produce in me your character, your nature, so this world sees who you are because the world needs Jesus. And Jesus had this kind of compassion. He had this kind of compassion for you and me when he found us dead, left by the side of the road, kicked to the curb by sin, and our past life, the off-scouring of the world, Jesus came along and he found us. He cleaned us up. He paid our bill. Provided for all of our future needs and then sets us on our way. He says, now you go and you do the same. So we have to get out of our minds the the bigotry or the racism. Like, this is such a hot topic in the world today, but the reality is that the answer for racism is not found anywhere other than Jesus. Jesus Christ is the answer for bigotry. Jesus Christ is the answer for racial animosity. And this, a passage like this, look, it just requires that we quit trying to do what the lawyer did at the beginning of the passage. And, you know, well, Kevin, you know, you don't understand. I mean, the, the homosexual community or the Democrats, they're ruining the country. It, look, it doesn't matter if you have hatred towards them. You, we have to deal with that. That's what Scripture is urging us to do. We have to love our enemies and do good to those who do not do good to us. Jesus goes on in the Sermon on the Mount, and he says, look, if you do good to those who do good to you, what? even sinners do that. If you're kind to people who are kind to you, or if you lend to people only hoping to get something back from them, sinners do that. He says, but, but you give to everybody who asks, and you don't expect anything in return. And you do good to those who hate you. You pray for those who spitefully use you. See, that's the Magna Carta. That is the description. That's the constitution of the kingdom of God. And it is radical. And I fall utterly short. We fall utterly short. And God, we need your spirit to fill us up. And I just pray in Jesus' name that you would come now in these last few moments and just, Lord, just tweak our heart. Would you carve away anything in our minds or in our attitudes that might hinder us from walking in close 
communion and fellowship with you? Would you fill us up to overflowing? Would you shape us and change us and mold us and make us more and more into the image of Jesus? Lord, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would just raise up a church here and around the city and around the country of people who love, who fulfill your commandment to love and to show the world what love looks like, to love one another, God, to be willing to extend forgiveness to one another, to be willing to let go of grudges, Lord, to be reconciled with people. Father, we thank you for how much you love us. We thank you for the work you have done in us. And we just ask in Jesus' name, meet us here in these last few moments as we worship you. Amen. Why don't we stand? We're going to close with one final worship song. As Pastor Mallet mentioned at the beginning of the Bible study, or the beginning of the morning, there will be prayer partners down at the front today. If you would like to have anyone pray with you, about anything maybe that the Lord is doing in your heart. Maybe there's a particular area, a particular relationship that the Lord would have you address or deal with. Or maybe there's somebody that God would want you to go and be reconciled with. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to see the Holy Spirit just do that work in you. Have a blessed week, man. You know, we hope to see you guys later in the week. Take note of the things we have coming up in the life of our church and just pray. Pray about how God would have you be involved. Uh, Christmas is an amazing season when we get to speak the name of Jesus. Uh, Really, in a way that other times of the year, we, we don't find people open to. So continually just be in prayer for this upcoming season in the life of our church. Let's go out with a worship song.
so in you there's joy unending joy and I will follow where you go I'll go where you stay I'll stay when you move I'll move I will follow whom you love I'll love how you serve I'll serve if this life I lose I will follow where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. Whom you love, I'll love. How you serve, I'll serve. If this life I lose, I will follow you. Have a great week. You guys are dismissed. <laughs>